Like when I'm not working, I'm working because my work is what I love and I couldn't envision seeing the world any other way than the way I see it now. Welcome back to Pack Heavy Chase Light. For this episode, we have Taylor Prince Frazier. When they first told me who Taylor was, they said he'd only been shooting for like two years and whoa, 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 whoa. This is the second, Sam. So you're meaning to tell me that he's worked with North Face and Doc Martin on some major campaigns and just absolutely killed it? Yeah. And he's only been doing this for two years? Unfortunately. I think we should switch jobs because this isn't working out very well for us. He does the same thing. He's just way better than us. I mean, say I haven't got to meet him, but Sam showed me some of his work and with God-given talent and pure creative genius, I mean, the work is through the roof. Stoked to introduce you guys to Pack Heavy Chase Light, episode 10 by Taylor Prince Frazier. My name is Taylor Prince Fraser. I'm a photographer and director from London. Yeah, so a few years ago, some friends and I started a Instagram page to basically tell stories through written word and carousels of images. The idea was in principle to max out the character count um, so that it'd become the longest form type of content that you could share on Instagram. We were pretty tired of the media scape and the type of stories and content that we were being fed by traditional publications. You know, every 15 seconds there'd be something new. So we wanted to create things that would last. It caught on, uh, people, as I say, people fucked with it, but I don't know if it's swear, but yeah, people enjoyed it. Some will call it an archival page, but um, we don't just talk about icons, we talk about the new people coming up and, and try to, we're trying to try to put them on the same level as, as the past icons that we also talk about. And we started running interviews with people that we knew within our networks, designers, artists, etc. I guess it's integral into, into all of our stories. I think that's what had connected us all. We're all passionate about the culture. We're all, we, we found the gap in in what was missing in the industry and, and tried to try to fill that gap by, by telling these stories and, and, and showcasing the talent that's um, not only coming out of London but coming out of the UK and coming out of elsewhere as well. And it got to a point where we were like we should probably start shooting you know the images for these stories we want to tell so we can really not just tell the stories how we want through written word but also create the images we want that were specific to that story. And I was like, cool, I'm gonna learn how to use the camera. And that was about two years ago now. And ever since then, um, I've just been taking photos and telling stories. You know, he was like, cool, like, fuck it, like, let me pick up a camera and just start shooting. Yeah, it just worked. Like, I can't lie, his first photos were, were missing completely. Then, like, I think that over time, like, he just got better and better and better. And, like, I think he's only been doing this for like about three years now. And like certain people have been doing it for like ages and they're not they're not that good. It's like it's kind of a testament to like kind of like the hard work and focus and like attention to detail he puts to things. I think the the one thing I love about shooting a film is the end process, which is printing. Like an image, like color profile that you don't get from digital, no matter how hard you try. Thank you. It's just so rewarding once you actually manage to get it right. It's kind of like a win-win. And that's the way that I like to operate. In the end result, I will always try and use the film images where possible, but only if you really get to print them. Because you know, if you're not printing them, you don't really get much out of the image as you would get just by scanning a negative and you're just creating like another digital file. So there's always an element of risk in shooting film, you know, it's something that you normally push clients to do and they'll agree to it, but then the cost of, you know, the, the film, yeah, the cost of the, did it? Did it come to an end? 
Yeah, the costs associated with film, developing, printing, etc, etc. Um, I haven't had the balls yet to like just go and shoot something solely on film. I'm still getting comfortable with the cameras that I use, which is a risk in itself for getting folks so need to worry about. And when you're moving with a camera and it's not just a moving subject, you know, a lot of these shots did come back like useless. I think useless for like atmospheric is the way I like to tell the client it looks because it adds like an energy and a dynamism to it that you can't get with a camera or a tripod or just a moving subject. Like you really feel like we're in these images and I'm just always so keen to explore different mediums and trying to find the right medium to communicate different stories and it's not just a matter of being like, this is the way I do things, this way things have to be done. It's a matter of like, okay, this is the story. What's the best way to tell the story? And I think a lot of the time that is through uh, the beauty of shooting on film and then printing images. See, man, being in London's like, it's really quite like nothing else. And I've grown up here, I've lived here, I've had the luxury of traveling to a lot of places. And it really does feel like you're at the epicenter of something special when it comes to creating. It's, it's priceless and it really, uh, it really definitely contributes to my career process. So yeah, um, I'm just waffling now, so I'm just gonna try and think of something else to say. Doing this has made me realise I'm so much more comfortable behind the camera. Yeah, bro. Oh, really? Like, what are we doing today? You tell me, boss. You tell me. Waddling. Yeah. Yeah, throwing it back to those old days, you know, being valued for nothing other than your cheekbones, jawline, and great smile. Which he had. Man, you got all of those. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out my mum for that one still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That probably contributed a little bit, but yeah. most of mum, most of yeah. most of Yeah, respect to the mum. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, he's doing pretty good for a man that now works on the other side of the lens. It's because I know, yeah, I know, touch, yeah, no, no one looks good. You've got a better idea of what looks good now on camera. I like it. Actually, that's actually true though, right? Because once you have done both sides of, like, of the coin, surely that helps you now as well going forward, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, when you hear the one more time, you know, it's like 10 more times. Yes. <laughs> Not one last time. It's like, yeah. Yeah, just one more time. 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 Just one more, you're nearly perfect. Yeah. Walking back and forth, no, but take his stuff in and out of the bag. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was intense. But now I've got my motion down perfectly. At least when I go to pack my bags in the future, I know the right technique. I know the space. I think one more was actually just over where we were, where you were trying to get the motion blur shooting into the flare. But you said one more six times? Yeah. It's kind of mellow. Yeah. yeah six, six takes on a one more is pretty good. When I started taking photos guess, professionally, but I never, like I always knew like how, like how to go about turning things I love doing into a business. The viability of the business element of photography definitely crosses my mind from time to time, but more so from a perspective of, I know if I take interesting photos and tell interesting stories that I will make money from it. As long as I continue to upskill, get better, try to find a new perspective for things and present something interesting to people. It was also like, I'm scared about the risk of not being good enough to compare to the people that I look up to. You know, failing in that sense, not necessarily in a financial sense, but from a creative standpoint, like I always seek to improve upon the images I'm making, whether it's moving image or whether it's stills. And the thought of people looking at my work and not finding anything, any sort of connection with it, is what scares me more than the thought of not making money from it. It's when you start getting into the niche, the avant-garde, you know, how can I make documentary photography feel more avant-garde or abstract, or how can I make commercial photography feel more abstract or different, or make it feel something in general. That's the risk, you know. So it was only recently that I started to say no to things. Uh, I think it was after I 
shot uh, a campaign for Nike Swim and we had an exhibition for it that came out and we were working on another really big project with uh, Dr. Martens that came out two months ago now. It kind of dawned on me and you know the guys that I work with that we are making stuff that people value and like big billion dollar businesses value and I'm putting a lot of equity and resources into. So if they're willing to do it, well, that's not to say that, you know, we don't do work for free or for very little. It's just to say that it's important to recognize when the right time is to do work for free and to give yourself and your time and resources to projects. Something I really respect about Taylor is his, his ability to see stuff from the other perspective, but also believe so honestly in his perspective. That shows in his work as well, because partially it's, it's Taylor's stubborn nature in the in the most positive way that he will not settle for someone telling him to make something that doesn't ring true to him because then he's being dishonest to himself and to be dishonest at oneself in that situation is detrimental. I think that this power is saying no. I think it comes I think it comes from like a bit of both to be fair. It's about knowing that like he kind of wants to make sure that he's putting in like kind of like as much work into this to make sure that the person you're shooting for wants to come back to you and shoot again, but also just like making sure that he's trying his best to like make sure this looks good. And it's really difficult at times for artists to say no, because we are scared this might be the last opportunity. We're scared if we say no, that we might ruin the relationship. We might come across as arrogant assholes. We might never ever get a chance to make a photo or an image or a sound again. But the reality of the situation is, is that's never the case. I don't know, he may, he may not agree, but I think he prides himself a lot within that as well. That shows in the imagery that comes out. It can be super raw and it can be super gritty. And it may not be the perspective that people like to see, but it's true. And it's, it's, it's true, to, true to him and his eye. Yeah, it ends up making all the work a bit better. So, a lot better, not a bit better. So yeah, I mean, you know, say no and say fuck off more often. This is the thing that sucks about electronic shutters. The bending of the images, like, I fucking hate it so much. Fucking mirrorless cameras, man. Earlier when I was talking about intention in photos, I think it's something that applies to my creative process across the board. You know, if it's research or building treatments or creative responses, I feel like I need to explain every single decision within that. And it's the same way I take a photo, like I need to be able to explain why I've included, you know, this in the background or this in the foreground or why I've shot in this focal length or why I've copped it this way or why I've chosen to uh, black and white color image or colorize a black and white image. I think that you can do things for aesthetic reasons, but I think that Ultimately, everything needs to have reason and purpose. And that's part of the all of research, understanding, and uh, you know, developing a clear idea of what it is that you want to make or capture. Myself and the guys that I work with, we're all quite emotionally invested in what it is that we're doing. And with that comes a certain level of commitment and investment we have with projects. So, at every point within the process, we're applying ourselves 110%. And that can be quite exhausting, which means, you know, we're not able to have, you know, 20 different conversations with 20 different prizes at any one time. Like we're really working on a project at a time and projects take time to cultivate and to build. And I'd like to think that that shows in the output of work we do. Like when we are working across multiple projects, you know, we look at, we look at the output and we're just like, it showed it soon. If we had more time and resources to put into a single project and a single unified focus, you know, I'm sure that it would have been better or would have got more out of it. That's not to say that we make bad stuff. I don't think we make bad stuff. I don't think we're capable of making bad stuff. Um, and that's not to blow our own trumpets, but because I'm a firm believer in that when you put as much time and energy and effort and care and love into something the same way that we do, you can't make something as bad because it's made of, it's made from love, it's made from care, it's made from research and interest and knowledge, and that's why it is. I feel like there's an element of risk to anybody that picks up, uh, I guess, an art form as their, their career choice. 
it's extremely competitive and the path to a successful career isn't always clear. And I think for me, the risk is worth taking because what I get on a day-to-day -day basis is like genuine happiness and satisfaction of what it is I'm doing and trying to do my bit to make to make the world a better place. And that's genuinely what I believe image making can do, and storytelling can do, is it can really give people a new perspective on things that they believe that they already understood or they had preconceived ideas about. So yeah, there's a risk to it, but I wouldn't do it any other way. Things changed and then when I moved back to Bamo, I felt all of a sudden like super motiv motivated to skate and I had my people to skate with. And then I went to LA to skate and I skated for a weekend. And all of a sudden I was surrounded by people who are actually not doing the regular thing. And I felt really inspired and I was like, okay, this is, I can do what I want to do. It makes sense now.